In the late summer of 1939, German fighter pilots relax in the sunshine before the onset of a war that would see them, within two years, contesting the skies against enemies over the Arctic Ocean, to the deserts of North Africa, and from the Bay of Biscay to the banks of the River Volga. Within five years, the Reich will have shrunk to the borders of the homeland, and the fighter arm of the Luftwaffe will have been driven to extinction in the very skies above Germany itself. It was on the 1st of March 1935, some two years after Hitler's rise to power, that he officially announced the existence of the new Luftwaffe. Thus, repudiating the Versailles Treaty, the Lincoln resettlement after the Great War had forbidden Germany the possession of an air arm. In reality, the new Luftwaffe dated from January 1933, with great care being taken to disguise the growth of the new German Air Force. The first mount of the new Luftwaffe fighter arm was the Heinkel AG-51. The initial production model entered service in 1935, equipped with and horse vessel Jagd Schwaden. The improved AG-51B appeared in 1936, and is seen here in this film dating from the same year. Although the type figured prominently in early propaganda films, its service life was short. The existence of the Arado 68 sealed the fate of the Heinkel fighter when, in 1936, Ernst Udeck, a newly installed inspector of fighters and dive bombers, tested both aircraft and adjudged the Arado to be the superior type. Destined to be the last biplane fighter to serve with the Luftwaffe, the Arado 68 is seen here along with the AC-51 engaging in mock attacks on a Dornier DO-23, one of the early types serving in the bomber squadrons. This particular AR-68F variant employed a BMW engine which conferred only a marginally improved performance over the AG-51. It was rapidly superseded on the production lines by the UMO-powered AR-68F variant, which equipped most of the young until the advent of the F-109 in 1938. It's a later UMO-powered Arado AR-68E which is seen here shooting out balloons set out by Luftwaffe ground crew for strafing practice. A distinctive feature of Luftwaffe fighters until about 1938 was their overall light grey colour scheme. The fortunes of the Jagdverban was to be anchored to the firm of Messerschmitt when, in November 1935, its BF-109 contender was selected to become the primary equipment of the future fighter arm. In 1937, the 109B began entering service, but low production meant that by the end of that year, just three Gruppen, belonging to JG's 132 and 234, had the 109 in service. Licensed production of the type to Fiesler, Focke-Wulf and Erler and appearance of the new C variant in 1938 saw numbers of the type increasing. These examples of the improved 109D are seen at the Jutteborg Dam base with an early JU-90 in 1938. When General Franco raised the flag of revolt against the People's Government in Madrid in July 1936, he appealed to both Germany and Italy for military assistance. Hitler dispatched 20 Junkers 52 transports to Spain to aid Franco's cause. This was followed in short order by other aircraft, including Heinkel HE-51s. The growing German involvement was carried out ostensibly by volunteers, although most were seconded military personnel sent to Spain in great secrecy. By November 1936, German involvement became more open and the Condor Legion was born. In March 1937, ME-109Bs first saw combat proving superior to the Soviet-supplied I-15 and I-16 fighters. New tactics were forged by the likes of Werner Molders and the combat experience gained by pilots such as Galland, Lutzow, Harder and others was put to good use back in Germany. Thus, when Germany invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, with the Second World War beginning two days later, the Luftwaffe, although officially less than five years old, had already been blooded and had also amassed a repertoire of combat experience that would give it great advantage over its enemies in the opening years of the conflict. 
Of the 1,600 aircraft amassed by the Luftwaffe for the air phase of Case White, just over 200 were ME109 fighters. By far and away, the bulk of these were the latest E model. And though examples of the earlier C and 44 of the D model seen here, belonging to 3JG233, were also committed to the fighting. As was to be repeated in other campaigns in the years ahead, Luftwaffe tactics from the outset were governed by the need to achieve air superiority over the battlefield. The first air operations over Poland were committed to the destruction of the Polish Air Force on the ground. The Jagdflieger, in consequence, found themselves in the opening phase of the campaign, providing escort to the bombers as they attacked Polish airfields. Although the Polish Air Force was woefully outnumbered, it put up a heroic defence. However, after the first few days, air opposition disappeared, and the ME-109s engaged in free hunts, searching out the skies and shooting down any surviving Polish aircraft. Most footage of 109s in action over Poland, and indeed from virtually every theatre in which the type operated up to 1943, when the air battles over Germany began in earnest, were taken from other aircraft, such as the ME-110 or Heinkel 111. The small size of the 109 cockpit prevented the pilot employing a cine camera to take footage. And this explains the small quantity of film shot at the Jagdflieger in action when compared to that of the Stukas and the bomber types. It was also the case that from a propaganda point of view, and this was the primary purpose for which the newsreels were made, images of Stukas and bombers provided far greater impact among the audiences who viewed them. Nevertheless, in the period after the Polish campaign, the merits of the ME-109 were highly touted by the propaganda department, and also by the Luftwaffe, fostering an image of superiority for the type that only came unstuck in the skies over Britain the following year. As the ground forces advanced, propaganda company cameramen attached to army formations filmed the handiwork of the Luftwaffe. On the former airfields of the Polish Air Force, hundreds of wrecks of destroyed and burnt out fighters and bombers lay scattered amid the detritus of bombed hangars, an image that was to be captured over and over again in France, Yugoslavia, Greece and Russia, as the preemptive strike designed to destroy the enemy air force on the ground became the tactic and signature of Luftwaffe operations at the onset of a new campaign. Control of the air was the prerequisite for the success of the Blitzkrieg strategy, which was to give the Wehrmacht its great victories in the opening years of the Second World War. In spite of its highly effective showing in combat, 109 losses over Poland were far from negligible. In all, some 67 out of the 200 committed were brought down, the majority being lost to Polish ground fire. When Josef Goebbels visited an ME-109 unit during the winter of 1939-40, the dark green camouflage was already giving way to light blue underwing and fuselage sides, and the two-toed green splinter finish on the wings and fuselage top. By early 1940, almost all early 109 models had been replaced by the Emil, as it was known to its pilots. In its E3 variant, the ME-109 was at the forefront of fighter technology during this period. On the eve of the German invasion of France and the Low Countries on the 10th of May 1940, the Luftwaffe could deploy nearly 1,000 ME-109E models. When the Luftwaffe was unleashed in the early hours of the 10th of May, its initial targets were the massive aircraft based on all 72 Allied airfields across France and neutral Holland. No fewer than 16 Gruppen of ME-109 supported the opening airstrikes by the Stukas and medium bombers. Although the Armée de l'Air and the RAF were able to field a number of modern fighters, the 109 Staffel quickly gained control of the air above the advancing German forces. Such was the speed of the advance of the Panzers that the fighter units found themselves being hastily uprooted and moved forward to new air bases and fields in their wake. The British, having fallen back on the port of Dunkirk following the German drive to the Channel Coast in their rear, now proceeded to organise the seaborne evacuation of their expeditionary force. 
Hitler, however, had halted his panzers in their drive on the port and accepted Goering's assurance that the Luftwaffe could block any British rescue attempt. With the launch of Operation Dynamo, hundreds of ships of all sizes now attempted to lift off the Anglo-French forces from the port and beaches around Dunkirk in the face of a determined attempt by the Luftwaffe to sink them. The subsequent commitment of the Jagdgruppen in support of the raids by Heinkels, Dorniers and Stukas now brought about the fiercest air fighting of the French campaign. The ME-109s now found themselves drawn into combat for the first time against the Spitfire, as the RAF tried its utmost to create a protective umbrella over the beaches of Dunkirk. However, the rate of the German advance was beginning to tell on the fighter units. The serviceability among the 109s was becoming problematic fuel shortages were occurring. However, it is also clear that in their encounters with Spitfire, the Jagdflieger had the clear impression that they had, for the first time, come up against an aircraft as effective as their own 109, piloted by men just as professional as themselves. Though RAF losses were considerable, the fighting was hardly one-sided, as they, in turn, claimed at least 200 Luftwaffe aircraft shot down through to the 5th of July. With the French surrender on the 22nd of June and the subsequent victory parade in Berlin, Hitler was at the pinnacle of his power. Even as he acknowledged the acclaim of his grateful people, he knew that the British government had rebuffed all overtures for a peaceful settlement with Germany and had determined to fight on. However, his ambivalent feelings towards Britain left him uncertain as to what to do. But by the 16th of July, he had made up his mind. In the preamble to his directive number 16, Hitler explained his decision by stating, as England, despite her hopeless military situation, still shows no sign of willingness to come to terms, I have decided to prepare, and if necessary, carry out, a landing operation against her. Given the code name Sea Lion, all, however, turned on the proviso that air superiority can be obtained. Herein lay the rub, for without the reduction of the RAF to the skies over England and the guarantee that the invasion forces would not be attacked from the air, the enterprise could not be entertained. Goering, however, was confident the Luftwaffe was up to the task. The formal beginning of the campaign against Britain finally began on the 13th of August 1940. Known as Adler Tag or Eagle Day, the Luftwaffe dispatched no fewer than 485 bomber and 1,000 fighter sorties across the south of England. Although much of the attrition among the single-engine fighter formations had been made up, the number of BF-109s available stood at some 760 machines, somewhat less than on the 10th of May. The first and second Staffel of Jagdgeschwader III Richthofen was based at beaumont le Roger and the third Staffel at Le Havre. As with most other 109 units in the early phase of the battle, they mainly operated free hunt sorties over the south of England that were designed to locate and destroy the opposing RAF fighters. Ranging sweeps, the Jagdflieger employed tactics first worked up in Spain. The basic formation was provided by the rote or pair of ME 109s flying some 200 yards apart, with the wingman flying slightly below and to the rear. Mutual support was the key to this formation. The Schwarm employed four 109s in effect and two pairs operating in tandem. These formations bestowed great flexibility on the German fighters effectively with the far more rigid in-play RAF VIC formation employed by Spitfires and Hurricanes. During the battle, pilots on both sides came to be portrayed as heroes by their respective media. Here, the face of Werner Mulders stares out from the cover of the Dutch edition of the magazine Signal. As the first pilot in the new Luftwaffe to be awarded the oak leaves to the Knight's Cross, Mulders' career was avidly followed by the propagandists, especially when appointed to command JG-51 on July the 27th. 
Adolf Galland was also lauded by the press. Although seen as perhaps playing second fiddle to Molders, he and Galland were friendly rivals in the ace stakes, each amassing high scores. Both, however, were partially eclipsed at this time by the meteoric rise of Helmut Vick. In four months in 1940, Vick was promoted by Goering from Staffel captain of 3 JG2 to Geschwader Commodore. At the time, he was just 25 years old. Vick was a gifted pilot, and his score by the end of the battle had risen to 56, giving him six more than Galland and four more than Mulders. During the campaign, Goering paid a visit to Vick's base at beaumont le roger As the air battle over England progressed, Goering began to express much unhappiness to the fighter commanders over the very high losses suffered by the bombers. The Stuka had been shown to be highly vulnerable. The concept of a heavy escort fighter had been found to be wanting in the high losses experienced by the ME-110, and the bombers were being shot down in large numbers by the RAF. Goering now demanded that his fighter commanders change their tactics. Vic, however, would die over the channel in November. As for many German Jagd flieger who crashed into the channel, rescue would be by HE-59 seaplanes marked with red crosses, even though the RAF regarded them as legitimate targets. Goering's insistence that the bombers be given greater protection from RAF fighters required that they give up their free hunting tactics and tie themselves more closely to the slower moving bombers. In the case of the Dornier 17 and Hyper 111, the 109s had to throttle right back to maintain station with these much slower moving aircraft. If escort duty had to be carried out, the Jag Flieger preferred to cover for the faster Junker Ju 88s, as seen in this footage. With the switch from attacking RAF airfields to bombing London, the ability of the ME 109s to give the protection to the bombers that Goering demanded was simply not possible by virtue of the short range of the Messerschmitt fighter. Lacking drop tanks that could have extended their range, the short legged 109 carried only enough internal fuel for a radius of just 125 miles from their base. The escort task required that they accompany the bombers from the French coast to the target and then back to the channel. As the fighters needed to retain just a small amount of fuel for combat over the target, this severely constrained the nature of the route flown by the bombers. In effect, this meant flying a straight line to the target, thus helping the RAF marshal its fighters more effectively to combat the incoming raid. By September, the Yacht Flieger had lost the freedom of action to attack the RAF fighters in the way that they thought best. From September 20th, the move to shift air raids on England to the night was a virtual acceptance that the attempt to defeat the RAF and achieve air superiority prior to an invasion had failed. In the four months of the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe had lost a total of 610 ME-109s and very many experienced pilots, whose loss was even more significant. But as a fighter, the ME-BF-109 had not been found wanting, nor had the pilots that flew them. Goering felt he'd been betrayed by his Luftwaffe and the Jagdflieger were his scapegoat. On June the 22nd, 1941, three million German troops crossed the Soviet frontier in the greatest land invasion in history. The cutting edge of Operation Barbarossa lay in the Panzer formations, whose task was to encircle and destroy the bulk of the Red Army before it had time to withdraw from the western frontiers into the depths of the Soviet hinterland. So optimistic was Hitler that the tried and tested blitzkrieg technique would yield success against the Red Army that he anticipated the Eastern Campaign being brought to a successful conclusion in just a few months. Crucial to the success of the opening battles at the frontiers was the assumption that even before the end of the first day of the campaign, the Luftwaffe would have established air superiority. 
priority task of the four Luftwaffe committed to the operation was the destruction of the bulk of the Soviet air force on the ground in the opening hours of the war. To ensure this happened at the same time as the German forces were crossing the frontier, the Luftwaffe arrived over the Soviet airfield at exactly 0330 hours. All combat types from the 775 level bombers, 310 troopers, 830 single engined ME 109s committed to the war in the East all found themselves dropping vast numbers of small fragmentation bombs. Lines of Soviet aircraft lined up on airfields all over European Russia and the Baltic states. The Soviets were later to admit to 800 aircraft destroyed on the ground and a further 400 shot down in combat by the Luftwaffe on the opening day of the war. German claims, however, ran to 4,000 Soviet aircraft destroyed by the end of June. Subsequently, day fighters were permitted to range freely over Soviet territory, where surviving fighters and bombers of the Red Air Force proved easy prey for the experienced Jagdflieger. Ground strafing of the numerous targets offered by Soviet rail and road traffic also became a common activity when in support of advancing German ground forces. Unlike in the West, where such air attacks forced the enemy to ground, Russian troops often stood and fired back with every weapon they possessed, resulting in mounting German casualties. Although many of the Jagdgruppen were still using the ME-109E, the arrival of the superior ME-109F4 in August confirmed overwhelming German air superiority over the Russian front. The success of the Jagdflieger over Russia can be measured by Mulder's score of 68 on the 22nd of June. In less than a month, he had become the first German pilot ever to down 100 aircraft. Unit scores grew so quickly as those of the individual so-called expert. On the 30th of June, the collective tally of the pilots of JG-51 made them the first German fighter unit in the Luftwaffe to have shot down a thousand enemy aircraft. Such were the rich pickings in the east that they were followed shortly by JGs 53, 54 and JG-3 in passing the thousand mark. Although these scores have often been thought incredible, the superiority of the Jagdflieger in the East in the opening months of the war in Russia was overwhelming. This success can be accounted for by their more effective equipment, the psychological, tactical and technical superiority of German pilots, their high sortie rates from airfields close to the front, and the essentially tactical nature of the Red Air Force. German pilots often commented on the way Soviet pilots provided them with easy targets by seemingly refusing to maneuver when attacked, continuing to fly in a straight line inviting destruction, as witnessed in this gun camera footage showing the downing of an Illusion DB-3 bomber by a 109E over Lithuania in August 1941. Tim Goering met high-ranking Luftwaffe staff and chosen fighter commanders in East Prussia. Present was Mulders, who was displaying the diamonds to his Knight's Cross, awarded by Hitler on the 16th of July. Witnessed by Udet, Goering presents the Knight's Cross to Airman Rudolf Knacker. Among other fighter commanders present is Volta Uzal of JG-2. Though hardly a stranger to publicity, Adolf Gowand is clearly embarrassed by the attention paid to him by the cameraman. Unbeknown to the JG-26 commander, this would be the last occasion on which he would see his friendly rival Mulders alive. Although the cameraman is at pains to capture the Reich Marshal playing the Luftwaffe overlord, Goering's devotion to his other interests was already causing command problems that were to have dire long-term consequences. Following his 115th victory, Goering had promoted Mulders to full colonel and appointed him Luftwaffe's inspector de Jagdflieger. 
an admin post involving travel to all points where the Yagva band was operating, Mulders gave up command of his beloved JG-51. Highly regarded by Goering and his fellow airmen, Mulders was an intelligent, perceptive leader of men whose contribution to the development of fighter tactics in the Luftwaffe played a significant role in its success in the opening years of the conflict. Care for his men had been earlier rewarded with the nickname Varty or Daddy. For the short time he was in post, he was spared the infighting of the Nazi leadership and was thus spared the disillusionment that became the lot of Adolf Galland, his successor. By 1941, the RAF had grown strong enough to embark upon a limited air offensive over France. Two types of ops were flown, both involving attacks on shipping, docks, railway sidings and military bases along the French coastal region to tempt the Luftwaffe into the air. This would then provide the opportunity of defeating German fighter units in combat. The first of these operations was christened Rhubarb, an air sweep over northern France flown by a squadron of fighters. The second and larger of these was named the Circus and involved both bombers and fighters. The core of the operation was provided by a detachment of Bristol Blenheim 4 medium bombers numbering from 25 up to 80. Escort for these was then provided by several squadrons of Hurricanes and Spitfires amounting to as many as 200 fighters on the bigger circuses. These had the task of hunting down and destroying the German fighter units as they rose to attack the bait offered by the bombers of the incoming raid. Although still the mainstay of the medium bomber squadrons, the Blenheim was a dated design and though due for replacement in the near future, still equipped some 11 light bomber squadrons and bore the brunt of circus operations until early 1942. Even when escorted by fighters, its slow speed and poor armament resulted in high losses to German fighters and flak. In early 1941, the new ME-109F began to enter Luftwaffe service. Due to the appearance of the superior cannon armed Spitfire 5B in February, delivery priority had been given to units serving on the German coast, MG Munition JG-2 and JG-26, receiving their first in March and April. The had received the even better 109F4 engine. Das ist Pets, der Staffelbär. Most fighter units had their mascots. Time between the sorties, pilots of JG-26 enjoyed themselves with the Schwab and Bear As JG-2 spread around a number of airfields in the Par de Calais, and the free group of JG-26 distributed in Fermeray through to the Belgian border near Haverfield, warning time of an incoming enemy raid was very short. On some occasions, the Colt Gallant, as Commodore of JG-26, ordered the whole of the scramble, whilst on other times just one group would be dispatched to deal with the enemy. It was the size of the raid that determined the response. A high level of readiness was expected at all times. Gun camera film taken the from the 109Fs the after this raid shows the number of Spitfire 5s being pepper. shot down. Other pilots who've not been scrambled and ground crew watch as hurricanes carrying bombs under wing or lower the buildings at the edge of the airfield. The armament of the Motor 109F is less than that employed on the earlier meals. Combined to two MG-17s mounted in the nose cowl, the 20 mm MG-151 cannon firing through the propeller boss. If all weapons were mounted along the aircraft's center line, it made the 109 highly effective in air-to-air -air combat. The 
Alan thought this a backward step and had a number of his own one and nine heads customised to carry a heavier armour. was fitted in each wing, and he had the power machine guns replaced with the more powerful 13mm MG1 one What appears to be a rogue edit that has crept into this report, done in Hamilton, shows it shooting down the RAF Lysander Army Cooperation Challenge. likely that it was caught flying near the coast of England by the 109 and eventually over the channel. However, it's quite possible that it was serving with flight number 419, whose task was to fly to France. British losses in 1941 on the surface ops amounted to 849 fighters. So actually, the Yankee and Capes for 950. Two of these ops cost the RAF further 900 losses. One of the fighter losses amounted to 103 machines. Oberst Galant. Unsere Jäger an der Kanalküste sind Tag und Nacht auf der Wacht. Abschied von General Oberst Ernst November 1941. Ritter Kreuzträger halten die Ehrenwache am Sarge des eingegangenen Generalflugzeugmeisters, der sich um den Aufbau der deutschen Luftwaffe unvergängliche Verdienste erworben hat. Der Führer betritt den Ehrensaal des Reichsluftfahrtministeriums. Der Führer drückt der Mutter sein Beileid aus. Houdet found himself appointed admin roles as chief of the technical office of the air ministry, and later as chief air inspector general, for which he was neither temperamentally nor intellectually suited. Blamed by Göring and Hitler for the failure of the Luftwaffe, held responsible for the production of aircraft and service the demands of the Luftwaffe, he was ever winding war. In seinem Lebenswerk hinterlasse er uns ein Erbe, das die Zukunft mitgestalten wird. Der letzte Fuß des Führers. Er ist allerdings verletzt worden. Er hat sich vor dem Militär verletzt. Der Führer erscheint, begleitet vom Reichsmarschall zum feierlichen Staatsakt. Just six days after the internment of Udet, Galland found himself once more a pallbearer in yet another state funeral. Die Auszeichnungen von Werner Mölders, der mit 115 Luftsiegen der erfolgreichste Jagdfliegerin in der Welt war. Der letzte Grund für die Führer. Mölders hat indicated his desire to attend Udets funeral. Er hat intended to be one of the pallbearers. At the time, he was on an inspection visit in Russia and had made arrangements to fly to Berlin in a Heinkel 111 transport. On the flight back to the capital, the plane crashed, killing all on board. By the time of his death, Mulder's face and career was well known through the coverage given to him by Goebbels' propaganda department. The state funeral he was given was deemed fitting for the highest ranking, most decorated Luftwaffe officer yet to die in the war. While Hitler was present to pay his respects as head of the state, it was Goering who had delivered the funeral eulogy. The Überführung zum Invalidenfriedhof. Among those in the funeral cortege were high-ranking Luftwaffe officers such as Field Marshal Milch and the commanders of the various Luftwaffe air fleets, including Kesselring, Stump, Lorzer and others. To their rear followed many of the commanders of the Jagdgeschwaden who'd come to pay their last respects to the former inspector of the Jagdflieger. Goering followed immediately behind the gun carriage bearing the coffin of the flyer as it wound its way through the streets of Berlin to the famous Invaliden War Cemetery, in which many of the famous figures from Prussian and German history were buried. The coffin was carried past the tomb of Manfred von Richthofen, and the German Spies scoring the base of the Great War, and his record of 80 kills had been passed by Mulders just six months before. 
Goering stood for a moment and raised his Reichsmarschall's baton in salute as he passed the tomb of the dead. As Mulder's coffin was lowered into the ground, Gallen, fleetingly seen here, was standing with the honour guard at the side of the grave with his sword. He noticed that Goering was indicating for him to step forward. He later related his shock at the Reichsmarschall's appalling bad sense of timing there and then Goering told him that he would follow in his dead friend's footsteps as the next Inspector General of the Jagdflieger. Barely a fortnight later, Operation Typhoon, the offensive launch to capture Moscow before the onset of winter, failed on the very outskirts of the city. Amid plunging temperatures, the exhausted German forces were then assailed by a carefully planned Soviet counter-offensive. The first winter had hit the Soviet Union for 15 years, the Wehrmacht stared disaster in the face as the Red Army pushed the Germans back from the gates of their capital. Unlike the army, the Luftwaffe had had the foresight to lay in supplies in the event of a winter campaign. But for those conducting air operations in temperatures as low as 40 below and amid driving blizzards, they were faced with challenges never experienced before. JG-54 Grünhertz was based on the airfields of Sivas Skyr and Gatshima, two operations over Leningrad employing VF-109Fs. One of the premier pilots of the Gishvada was Hans Philipp, who served with the first grouper. Mobile heaters were necessary to pipe warm air onto the engines of the 109s to ensure that they didn't seize up Philip, better known as Fitz, prepares to fly his 109 off on a mission. Prominent on the side of his fuselage is the green heart and the shield with the Nuremberg coat of arms, denoting the first grouper. It became common practice among 109 units serving in the east to remove the undercarriage covers in the autumn and winter to prevent build-up by mud and snow. These 109s of one JG-54 have been scrambled to intercept an incoming Soviet raid. As the combat is viewed from the ground, Philip's gun camera captures his destruction of a Yak-1 fighter. An example of the new generation of Soviet types appearing in increasing numbers over the Eastern Front. Vortex and vast number of more effective aircraft soon to make their appearance in the ranks of the Soviet Air Force. Whether shot down by Soviet fighters or by the hail of ground fire thrown up by Russian troops whenever German planes flew overhead, Luftwaffe pilots would be desperate to bring their aircraft down behind their own lines. In a war in which little quarter was given, falling into Russian hands was a prospect few Jagdflieger were prepared to contemplate. Indeed, some German pilots are known to have chosen suicide rather than be captured. However, once they had crash-landed behind their own lines, every effort was made to recover the damaged fighter, as is seen here. Luftwaffe ground crew have secured the assistance of an Army 8-ton half-track to recover this downed 109F belonging to JG-54. Against a backdrop of very high Luftwaffe losses since the onset of the Russian campaign, Every attempt was made to recover downed fighters, repair them, and put them back into service. In this case, the damage to this 109 does not appear to be excessive. Removal of the propeller boss has enabled a steel towing cable to be wrapped around the prop, and the aircraft is then dragged across the field back onto the road. From here, it will be returned to the airfield for rebuilding. Usual cameramen were often on hand to cover awards to servicemen at the Führer's headquarters in the Wolkshans of Rastenburg in East Prussia. On this occasion, three Luftwaffe fighter pilots are receiving their knight's crosses, the Ritterkreuz. Hauptmann Philipp, 94 Abschüsse. Hauptmann Uben, 70 Abschüsse. Und Oberleutnant Ostermann, 81 Abschüsse, wurden beide mit dem Eichenlaub zum Ritterkreuz ausgezeichnet. One of these is Hauptmann Philipp, who's been awarded the Eichenlaub with oak leaves to his Knight's Cross for his victories in the air over Russia. Philipp would go on to become the second Luftwaffe pilot to score over 200 kills. His final tally would be 206, dying in combat with US Thunderbolts in October 1943. After President
presentation of the Free Take Comedy and Cake with the visiting Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler. Gallen's first command role was to oversee the provision of air cover and the break out from the breast of the warship Scharnhorst to Eisenau and the Prinz Eugen, in the passage to the English Channel in Germany. Operation Cerebrus began late on the 11th of February 1942. The air control fighter cover provided by JGs 1, 2 and 26 and an attachment of ME 110. The audacity of the German plan was to triumph over the delayed though violent reaction of the RAF who did their utmost to sink the vessels. German involvement in North Africa from March 1941 onwards was a consequence of accident rather than design. In the wake of the failure of the Italians' attempt to advance into Egypt during the second half of 1940 and the success of the British counter-offensive, which had conquered much of the Italian province of Libya by early 1941, Hitler offered limited German military assistance to Mussolini to prop up his position there. Both on the ground and in the air, Italian forces had performed poorly against the inadequately armed British forces. Erwin Rommel was appointed to command the German Afrika Corps, the small expeditionary force built around the 5th Light Division. His brief was to support the Italian position in Libya in the face of the British advance towards Tripoli. However, the German had other ideas and he intended to go over to the offensive as soon as his forces were strong enough to sustain such an operation. In the next two years, the image of Rommel alighting in the desert alongside his forces his personal Diesel Storch liaison aircraft was one which the German people would become familiar with in the weekly cinema newsreel. To protect the vulnerable Stukas, fighter support was provided by ME-109Es of 1st Grouper JG-27 and the 7th Grouper of JG-26. In September 1941, the first ME-109 F-1 and F-2s appeared in the theatre with the arrival of the second grouper of JG-27. While the African theatre produced a number of stars among the ranks of the Jagdflieger, none shone more brightly than Lieutenant Hans Joachim Marseille. Although his final tally of 158 confirmed aerial victories at the time of his death on the 30th of September 42 was much less than the very high scores of many aces serving in Russia, all of Marseille's kills had been against the RAF in the West and North Africa. Here, the skills of the British and Commonwealth pilots were generally of a higher order than those of the Red Air Force. Indeed, Adolf Gallen placed Marseille in the foremost rank of the Experten when he described him as the unrivaled virtuoso of the fighter pilots. He first saw service in 1940 when he joined the fourth grouper of JG-52. His scoring career took a while to take off, achieving just six victories in his time on the Channel Front. His behaviour and attitude at this time did little to endear him to his unit commander, Johannes Steinhoff. Transferred to the first grouper of JG-27 at the end of 1940, then to North Africa in March, his tally of skills began to grow rapidly thereafter. In his preferred mount of the BF-109F, his intuitive skills as a pilot enabled him to dispatch enemy aircraft with an economy of ammunition that became legendary. The most remarkable day of his career over the desert came on the 1st of September 1942 when, in a fury of non-stop sorties, he shot down 17 confirmed enemy aircraft. By this time, he was a familiar feature in the newsreel reports from the theatre. In the event, his death was not due to enemy action, but to a fire in the engine of his new 109G. Bailing out, he hit the tailplane, knocked himself out, and plunged to his death in the desert below, having only just been awarded the diamonds to his knight's cross following his 126th kill. German day fighters had first seen combat over water when seven JG-26 flying 109Es under the command of Oberleutnant Joachim Munchenberg operated with success in early 1941. 
The need to stop the RAF intercepting Rommel's supply lines from the island saw the transfer from Russia in late 1941 of elements of Luftwaffe II, including the whole of JG-53 Picas, and two JG-3 in depth, the bases in the Norman climbs in Sicily. By the end of January, when Luftwaffe operations began rising to a crescendo, over 100 109F fighters were available for operations over Malta. As Commander-in-Chief South, all Luftwaffe units in Sicily fell under the command of Field Marshal Albert Kesselring. Known to his troops as Smiling Albert because of his ready grin, he's seen here paying an inspection visit to one of the units of JG-53. The winter rains on the island have turned much of the ground into glutinous mud as Kesselring nearly discovers to his cost. The rains also led to the landing fields being reduced into muddy tracks. Field Marshal also takes the opportunity to take a closer look at an MU-109F. Throughout February 1942, the Luftwaffe launched daily bombing raids against Malta, directed at the naval facilities and defences, followed in March and April by the systematic targeting of airfields and the total destruction of the RAF fighter presence on the island. By the end of April, almost 6,000 bombing sorties had been flown by JU-88s, HE-111s and DO-17s of the 2nd Flieger Corps. This sustained bombing was seen as the prelude to invasion of the island. In company with the bombers, the number of day fighter sorties also increased with an average of 1,000 flown each week following March the 20th. Although 15 Spit 5s had been flown into Malta during the same month and subsequently encountered in combat over the island by the ME 109s, the Jagdflieger still increased their score over the RAF fighters. By the end of March, the tempo of offensive operations had resulted in the day fighters finally securing air superiority over the island. Gun camera film from 109Fs operating over the island records the destruction of a number of Hawker Hurricane fighters. This was the primary RAF fighter defending the island until the arrival of the Spitfire. Its performance was significantly less than that of the 109F and usually ended up coming off worst in air-to-air -air combat. In 1942, the Hurricane was increasingly being replaced by the Spitfire and the Desert Air Force's fighter role far more as a ground attack type and fighter bomber. With the failure to implement Operation Hercules and the British reinforcement of the defences of Malta, air superiority over the island was lost by the Luftwaffe during mid-1942. For the Luftwaffe and the RAF, the most significant event of the ongoing air war over the Channel in northern France in the second half of 1941 and into 1942 was the entry into service of a formidable new fighter plane in the ranks of the Jagd Band. First seen by German audiences in the sequence that begins with the pilots and ground crew of the Schwader relaxing before the onset of battle. The alarm is sounded as an incoming RAF raid is reported. Ground crew and flat gunners race to their charges and land their stations. Airfield defences were based around numerous light 20mm flat guns, medium 37mm flat weapons seen here, and batteries of the heavier calibre 88mm 
Mortar Guns, these would provide the first line of defence against the infantry hostiles. Yes, the tannoy sounds the battle alarm, all is abandoned as pilots and their supporting ground crew rush to the planes. First, the short nosed early series of FW 190s entered service with JG 26 in July 1941, and served alongside the former BF 109Fs of the Geschwader. Although having its origin in a 1937 specification for an ME 109 replacement, the success of the latter led to the FW 190 being regarded as a second iron for the Jagva band. Built around the BMW 801 radial engine, the FW 190 first flew in 1939, but continuing engine problems delayed service entry for nearly two years. Once in action, however, the 190 revealed a marked superiority over the Spit 5 in almost all aspects of air combat, except for the latter's smaller turning circle. The 190 reigned supreme until the second in 1942, when the RAF rushed the improved Spitfire Mark 9 into service. The remains of the shot down RAF fighter is examined by the captured airman and the Germans. Turning ME 109s and FW 190s fly over the airfield. A number of waggling their wings can indicate victories in the air battle. Post battle analysis, Joachim Münchenberg talks tactics with fellow flyers while ground also seen is the irrepressible Pips Triller, who has become a Commodore of JG 26 and remain its commander through to war's end. Priller was an inspiring leader and a superb pilot, amassing a tally of 101 victories, all achieved in the West. He is perhaps best remembered as one of two Luftwaffe pilots to strafe the Normandy beaches on D-Day and live to tell the tale, an event recaptured in the film The Longest Day. The alarm sounds once again as a further raid, this time by RAF light bombers, is reported inbound. Pilots rush to their planes and there is a further scramble as 109s and 190s draw off to attack the enemy aircraft. The Luftwaffe fighters hone in on the defending fighters as the gun cameras catch more shots of RAF fighters being shot at and brought down. Although the gun camera images are somewhat indistinct, there is a possibility that the RAF type being shot down here is an early Hawker Typhoon. Although only crashed RAF aircraft are shown here being sent for scrap in Germany, 1942 also witnessed the appearance of the first fighters and bombers over France wearing the US stars and bars. They were the harbingers of the storm soon to break in the skies over the Reich in 1943, engaged the Luftwaffe's day fighters in the greatest air battles of the war.